to this program uh, on uh, discussion on and a brief discussion on uh, the masters in distance education program course es317 distance education economic perspective as uh, you would have seen in the program guide uh, this is one of the courses within the five courses of the masters program um, the other courses are dealing with research curriculum design and development um the last uh, course deals with uh, the project work and es319 deals with um staff development or continuing professional development and distance education i'm the course coordinator of es317 and in this course uh, we will take uh, whatever little time we have to discuss what this course is all about what kind of assignments that have been set for this course and uh, how you you would be preparing for the assignments and um, um also prepare for the term and examination as you will see the course uh, like any other course uh, within the masters program has five blocks in block 1 you will study economics of education the basic foundations of economics of education which will contribute to your understanding blocks 2 3 4 and 5 Block 5 uh, is devoted to some of the very important readings uh, within uh, distance education economic perspective basically dealing with costing and funding funding of course we have one unit within the entire course which we would like to expand in our next revision but while discussing all the five uh, papers or or publications that we have included as readings in the fifth block also touch upon funding as an important issue but largely devoting to costing income and expenditure and unit cost discussion in block 1 uh, in the in the foundation uh, uh, module you have three units um, dealing with conceptual foundations education as investment and cost analysis in education there are many other concepts uh, minor concepts which are uh, within the domain of economics and therefore economics of education but we have included we have tried our best to include as much as possible as a foundation understanding um towards uh, economics of education within the first module within the conceptual foundation if you have the block with you you could also refer to the block within the conceptual foundation we have discussed why study economics of education what is economics and what is economics of education and what is the boundary of economics of education we have also discussed education as consumption that um, education which is uh, obtained for its own benefit is is considered as consumption but when education is um, an expenditure committed or devoted or undertaken to achieve something and which will be leading to employment prospects or some kind of uh, self employment or any kind of gainful employment uh, and more so when it is relating to skill development we would consider education as an investment governments have been considering education as investment though initially in the budget in the fiber plan as well as yearly planning the the, the money allocated is considered as expenditure but certainly this is uh, a cost this is an investment this is a cost to the society will come to costing in unit 3 in unit 3 in cost analysis we have touched up on um cost is a social cost by the public uh, uh, authorities that is the government uh, government expenditure is certainly a social cost but also institutions spend money either directly received from the government or uh, from endowments from the student fees and uh, some other sources uh, that you would see within the within the context of cost analysis therefore uh, social cost institutional cost plus private cost we have discussed private cost uh, we have just touched up on private cost which would like to devote more uh, 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 space in our next revision uh, students incur especially in distance learning students their commuting cost uh, transport cost extra budgetary provision for uh, buying extra additional books though we we do not encourage that but certainly students go for some of the uh, additional books that are necessary to to comprehend uh, um, a module or a course uh, students might be uh, devoting money for their stationery uh, for typing cost and so on and so forth and if at all students are going for extra tuition i'm not sure about that but certainly these are all private costs that the students are spending for themselves so private cost and institutional cost put together 
um, a social cost. And in, in private costing, we have also touched upon uh, the concept of uh, alternative opportunities of employment. So uh, we have not considered that in the calculation of cost analysis here, uh, alternatives available. So we would call that as opportunity cost. And uh, opportunity cost, both in festive -fest education as well as distance education, we do not consider that because of the reason that opportunity cost could be considered for a calculation of cost analysis, especially unit cost analysis, that is cost per head uh, per one student or one graduate out of the cohort um, of one batch or whatever uh, the cost analysis that you will study within that. Uh, there are different ways of uh, uh, calculating costs. But uh, we have not uh, included opportunity cost in our cost calculation because of the simple reason that there is no guarantee for gainful employment once one completes uh, any um, uh, terminal education. Terminal education could be 10 plus 2. Terminal education could be undergraduate education or even postgraduate or doctoral programs. So therefore, we have not included uh, opportunity cost within our cost calculation. After conceptual foundation in unit two, you, we have discussed education as an investment and more particularly why distance education is considered as an investment. We have said that, that uh, distance education is considered as an investment because of the simple reason that distance education provides opportunities to, to students otherwise unavailable to them because of many constraints that are imposed by face-to-face -face education, coming to the class regularly with certain qualifications, certain age groups, and so on and so forth, provides flexibility, provides opportunity to students to pursue their education, whether it's a continuing professional development, skill acquisition, or even knowledge acquisition, or even a non-certificate, non-degree oriented, non-credit oriented programs. One studies without really considering for gaining a certificate or a diploma or a degree. In that case, um, education would be considered, distance education would be considered as an investment because it provides alternative opportunities, students to pursue um, the, 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 the uh, courses of their own interest, and therefore they are willing to invest in that. Uh, distance education contributes to development of human resources in diversified areas. In some of the, some of the cases, uh, where uh, the programs are, or courses are not available in any formal uh, educational context, whether it is a full-time education within college or university, or it is a training program available elsewhere, or a crash program available elsewhere. Some of these programs that you will see if you look at uh, the kinds of programs Indira Gandhi National Open University offers, you would realize that there are quite a few programs which are not available in formal educational outlets. For instance, in disaster management, human rights, intellectual property rights, cardiology, uh, for, as a continue, community cardiology, the continuing program, rural surgery, for instance, um, in, uh, women's self-help group, and Raj. And these are the kinds of programs and quite a few other programs uh, which are not available, also, which contribute to social development, individual development, national development, and which also contribute to um, uh, general socioeconomic development of individuals and the, and the nation state. And therefore, uh, investing in these programs, students who are coming forward willingly to invest in these programs. And as institutions, as we have invested in these programs, in program design and development and program offer, there's an institutional cost. Uh, students are coming forward to pay fees and get admitted to these programs as, as their uh, own, own private cost. But that private cost comes down to institution because once they, they pay fees, that is considered as, an, as, as a part of the institutional earning and therefore institutional cost because institution is spending on them. So um, in a nutshell, we have discussed that uh, prison's education significantly contributes to um, um, development of human resources and therefore could be considered as an investment. Distance educa edu education is, is also considered as a consumption, but distance education, if it is just for leisure, uh, could be considered as a consumption. Somebody who is retired and pursuing distance education for one's own um, happiness, peace of mind, spending laser time and so on and so forth, could be considered as a consumption, but uh, if one is utilizing that for enriching the life, life expectancy and peace in life, it could also actually be considered as an investment by that particular individual who is coming to study through distance education. We have presented in that uh, unit too 
education and earnings, the, the, the relationship between higher level of education and higher level of earning as a proportionate relationship. We have also discussed the production function in education, not as much as it could be strictly linear in case of economics, but certainly uh, in education and distance education, um, there is a production function uh, operating and which contributes to input process output analysis. Uh, we have also discussed the issue of wastage in education because it's an important issue. Uh, wastage uh, traditionally and uh, in, in classroom context as well as campus-based education as well as in distance education, we would consider persistence, attrition, um, dropout as important considerations contributing to sometimes wastage and students not coming back for re-registration in terms of credit accumulation. They have not completed the program. Uh, totally, but accumulated certain credits and, and, and got out of the program and, and are coming back for re-registration. Certainly considered as a wasters from institutional point of view, maybe the individual has gained something and is willingly withdrawn from the program. It's very difficult, it's a tricky issue, wasters and drop out because for one year program we are giving now three years to complete and if one is not completing within three years and up to three years we are not sure what is the dropout rate and after three years if one is coming back for re-registration then certainly uh, we could not consider that as a dropout but uh, if the student goes out and joins another program which we do not know that the student has continued as a part of credit accumulation elsewhere uh, we would uh, also not know that whether the student is a dropout we might mistakenly consider that as a dropout so far our own institution is concerned so these are the aspects that we have discussed in education and investment. But the most important unit within the third unit within this, this, this module is cost analysis in education. We have uh, considered uh, different ways of looking at educational cost. We have discussed uh, fixed and variable costs. You would realize that uh, uh, the fixed costs uh, uh, as they are conceived and understood in conventional face-to-face -face education would undergo changes in distance education. For instance, if you are designing and developing course materials, you are preparing camera the copy or a final version, a master copy of an audio or video program or a multimedia CD, for instance. Um, these are considered as investment invest irrespective of the number of students that are getting admitted to it. Um, to the program and therefore um, um, till that point of time it would certainly be considered as a fixed cost because that is fixed irrespective of the number of students admitted. But once we know that uh, there are 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 students you go on making multiple copies of that that would vary uh, depending on the your printing would vary or your duplication of programs would vary depending on the number of students and therefore that would become a variable cost. So you would, you would appreciate uh, the discussion of uh, fixed and variable cost, marginal and average cost uh, within, within the cost calculation within education which are equally applicable as a formula, equally applicable to distance education too or any kind of technology enabled education or technology based education and training programs. Um, we have discussed social and private costs, social cost uh, from the point of view of the government and the institution, institutional cost, and private cost from the point of view of students. And uh, as I said earlier, we have not included uh, opportunity cost uh, since it is uh, difficult to apply opportunity cost uh, given that there is no guarantee for alternative employment opportunities once one completes uh, any kind of program, uh, schooling, college, or, or university education. Uh, we have uh, discussed how uh, to estimate educational cost. Within that, we have discussed cost uh, effectiveness and cost efficiency. These two uh, terminologies are very important within this education as well as in education too. Cost effectiveness would refer to any kind of investment or expenditure that has been made, keeping in view certain objectives in mind. And we, if we have been able to achieve those objectives as per the stipulation, pre-stipulation done earlier, at a level which is acceptable, which is already defined, if we could achieve that given an expenditure or a budgetary allocation, we will say that uh, our programs are cost effective because we have been able to achieve those objectives and we have been able to spend that money. At times we are not able to spend that money but try to achieve that objectives and when we don't spend that money and we are not able to achieve those objectives. So money has been spent well. Uh, within the um, rules and regulations and uh, we have been able to achieve those objectives at a level which we have specified which are achievable. Cost effectiveness. Cost efficiency would refer to uh, a kind of situation whereby you would uh, spend money 
and uh, try to achieve more than what was stipulated or that you would be spending less money to achieve the same which was stipulated earlier. So either spend less money to achieve whatever was stipulated or uh, spend uh, more, um, uh, same amount of money to achieve more than what was stipulated. Then we would say that we are um, achieving what is called cost efficiency and we are cost efficient. So in distance education, cost effectiveness and cost efficiency would play a very significant role in deciding institutional decision making, uh, in, in, in taking institutional decisions with regard to budgetary allocations and expenditure under different heads, uh, support services, uh, material design and development, overheads, uh, administration, um, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and accordingly, the fee structure could be decided. And, and therefore, um, it is important that uh, we, we uh, maintain cost effectiveness and try to be efficient in our budgetary allocations as well as achievement or expenditure in, 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 in whatever has been allocated in the budget. So we need to be efficient and we need to be effective in our cost uh, system. Uh, we have discussed cost benefit analysis, which you would appreciate the concept uh, given by the World Bank, and uh, we um, have tried to explain how this is applicable in education and how it is really difficult to, to do a cost benefit analysis within the context of distance education. And uh, we have given an illustration and evaluation of cost benefit analysis within, within Block 1. If you go to block two, whatever we have discussed within block one, we have tried to apply in block two in economics of distance education. And you would see that there are four units in that, distance education and human resource development, financing in distance education, cost functions in distance education. And we have uh, given some case studies in unit four uh, in respect of cost structures in some selected distance learning systems. In uh, distance education and human resource development, we have discussed that how distance education could be considered as an investment and uh, uh, how distance education contributes to human capital resource formation. Um, it contributes to growth of human knowledge, development of skills, uh, life satisfaction, and, uh, uh, and we have argued that uh, uh, more than the formal classroom education, the kinds of programs and continuing professional development programs, continuing education programs that we offer through distance education contribute significantly to support uh, lifelong learning and lifelong education. That's very important to us because uh, distance education supports continuing education and supports lifelong education. And lifelong education is very important uh, in terms of a broader framework of human resource development because human resource development is certainly knowledge, attitude, and skills immediately um, vis a vis uh, through um, a certificate or diploma or degree program. But uh, when it comes down to application, or as we call transfer of skills to work situations, for instance, or application of what is learned to social contexts, there is no limit to learning. And as long as one leaves on this earth, so education is from uh, womb to tomb, as they say. So lifelong learning is assuming greater importance, and therefore education must contribute to um, significant life skills and uh, for effective utilization of one's own time uh, within the given social context, socioeconomic context. And therefore, distance education as a prerogative that it could address more significantly lifelong education than any other system of education available to us. Uh, so this is an important area that we have given stress, and uh, uh, we have argued that how distance education uh, contributes to national human resource development needs and contributes to the needs of the national economy, uh, because uh, the kinds of programs that are uh, offered through distance education are social, socio-economic development programs, which are not uh, generally not available in formal classroom settings or campus-based education. And distance education, by virtue of providing opportunities for continuing education and lifelong education, significantly, obviously, significantly contributes to um, national socioeconomic development. That's what we have argued. And uh, we have also argued for a case that distance education contributes to the quality of human resources, quality in the sense that uh, um, uh, um, a human resource, a human being is uh, uh, willingly coming forward to upgrade, update uh, the skills, knowledge skills, and develop favorable attitude, positive attitude to life and uh, socioeconomic contexts. 
in relation to others and uh, broadly to globalization and the changes that are come, taking place in the society, more so in technological developments. All these put together uh, would contribute to quality and quality in terms of uh, constant updating, upgradation of uh, uh, knowledge and skills and, and, and uh, reformulation of uh, attitudinal um, dispositions um, which are very necessary for a peaceful and good social living and healthy social living. So this is what we have discussed in Unit 1. Unit 2 talks about financing in distance education. What we have broadly would like to say that what we have broadly discussed is financing in education and the financial mechanisms, financial procedures that we follow in education which could be applied to distance education. We have given examples of distance education and we have not provided a case study for distance education which we would like to do in our next revision. You will see that uh, we have discussed about budgeting, um, uh, different kinds of budgeting and financial management uh, procedures and, and, the, and the core elements that we have discussed in financial management would uh, include uh, financial resource mobilization, resource deployment and uh, 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 additional resource generation and dis distribution because efficient resource mobilization and efficient resource deployment and resource utilization uh, are very crucial to financial decision making because once the resources are allocated they must be deployed uh, 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 effectively across uh, different uh, sectors or units or activities um, and they must be efficiently utilized. They must be effectively utilized and they must be efficiently utilized. And this effectiveness and efficiency that we have seen a little earlier, that how, how they are related to each other and how they are still different from each other. In, in case of financial management, you will see that uh, on page 33 onwards in block 2, we have discussed about efficiency, equity and flexibility in financial decision making. Unit 3 is about uh, cost functions in distance education and uh, they are more particularly all the cost concepts of Unit 3 of Block 1 that we had uh, already discussed. We have tried to apply that into the context of distance education. That cost function would include fixed and variable cost, average and marginal cost. Average cost is the total, total expenditure divided by the number of students, students or number of graduates um, as, as the case may be. Uh, if you would like to calculate uh, the unit cost uh, of students, then it is certainly divided by students. If the unit cost of graduates, that those who have already passed out, then, then certainly divided by the number of graduates uh, for that cohort who have passed out. Um, but in any case, average cost and marginal cost, there is a strong relationship between these two because uh, once uh, additional students get admitted, uh, we have provided a cost function within that. Once the additional students get admitted, any additional student gets, gets admitted. Whatever little increase in cost happens, uh, there is an increase in average cost. But certainly there is an increase in marginal cost. Marginal cost, with, that means the cost incurred with one additional student admitted to that course or program. So average cost is the total cost divided by the number of students and marginal cost is the cost incurred with every additional student admitted to the program. So therefore, average cost should uh, go on uh, decreasing with additional students admitted and marginal cost should also go on decreasing. But a point will come when average cost will come down to almost touching the baseline or come down to almost uh, zero and so also the marginal cost and uh, henceforth the both the marginal and average cost will start increasing. Uh, and a time will come, they will start increasing at an increasing rate. And that's very alarming to us. And therefore, it is very important to say, we have discussed there, that how, given the number of students, because once you increase the number of students, your unit cost, that is cost or expenditure incurred per student, would go on decreasing. Increase the number of students will decrease both average and marginal cost. But a time will come when that decrease will be constant. And after that, the curve will go up and uh, uh, the cost will go on increasing. And so much so, it will increase at an increasing rate uh, that the both the average and marginal cost will cross or will surpass 
the initial average and marginal cost at the beginning with whatever number of students we had calculated in that cost. And that is an alarming point beyond which we should stop admitting students. So there has been um, a, um, a formulation uh, that uh, with uh, uh, scaling up, that with increasing the number of or the, or the in, uh, amount of activities, including the emitting number of students, the both the average and marginal cost, and therefore total cost will uh, or unit cost will come down. But uh, after a certain period of time or point of time, within that uh, operation of activity, the both the marginal and average cost, and therefore unit cost will go on increasing. Therefore. Uh, that is the point where to stop the activities and rethink, reformulate, diversify, think about efficiency, and so on and so forth. Um, therefore, the, the traditional conception that uh, um, more the number, less the cost or unit cost, it doesn't apply always. There is a point where more the number will increase the cost, increase the, the initial uh, average and marginal and unit cost. That w what we have discussed in cost functions in uh, in, in, in distance education, and we have uh, uh, tried to analyze unit cost uh, in a way because there are different interpretations of unit cost. Unit cost could be per credit. Unit, I mean, you know the credit system. Unit cost could be per credit, per course, per student, per graduation and so on and so forth. Unit cost could be per dropout. So there are different interpretations of unit cost and there are different calculations that we have given there. And in cost structure of distance learning systems in the fourth unit, um, we have given some case studies uh, of some institutions which uh, we thought would be um, beneficial to you. And these we have expanded in block five, giving full case studies of uh, five institutions. Here we have included, uh, of course, we have discussed the factors that contribute to cost of education, um, the number of programs offered, for instance, number of, uh, number of programs, uh, number of courses given a choice, for instance. That for one particular course, if I have to take up only one course, which is compulsory, and if you are giving me an option, um, uh, I have to choose out of five courses, one course, then I, as an institution, we have invested for five courses, whereas the students will take up only one course. Um, whatever the credit number could be, four credit or six credit or eight credits. So therefore, g given the choice or expansion of the choice of the um, uh, number of courses or the, the basket of the course structure, if it is expanding, then certainly we are spending more. That will increase, that will affect the unit cost, that will increase the unit cost. Uh, number two, the process of course development. How much time and money we are spending on course design and development. The more time and more money we spend, that will be uh, broken down or divided uh, uh, by the number of students admitted and therefore the unit cost will increase. If you are reducing time and money spent on, on the course development um, uh, processes, then certainly the unit cost will cool down. Um, uh, use of part-time faculty, especially our part-time counselors. Uh, we have said that 10% of our counseling time, 10% uh, of our total credit time that is available per year will be, if we are offering uh, 32 credits, for instance, and one credit is 30 hours, so we have 960 credits. And therefore, 10% of that time, say 96 hours, will be putting in for that program for counseling that we will be providing. There is a provision from the institution whether students are willingly coming to the study center or not. But we have made provision. If we increase that 10% to 15, 20, 30%, then certainly your expenditure is increasing, and therefore your unit cost will go on increasing. Your both average and marginal cost will increase, and therefore the unit cost will increase. We have discussed the case study of UK Open University, the British Open University. University. We have discussed the Universidad Nacional Abierta in Venezuela. We have also discussed the University of the Air, Japan. You will find differences in, in case of, in case of uh, um, uh, 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 University of the Air, Japan. You will say that you will see that we have discussed cost per student, cost per graduate, and cost per credit. That will give uh, conceptual clarity to different kinds of costing methodologies that are available. Institutions apply their own, devise their own methodologies, and apply their own methodologies. There is not a single methodology which could be available to all the institutions of uh, distance teaching and learning because of varieties of context within which they operate their own institutional structure, their own decision-making structure of operation of uh, their uh, program design, development, delivery, and so on and so forth. And these case studies, I think, should be beneficial to you in, um, in formulating uh, your opinion. Your, your strategies, how you will be applying costing methodologies to the context of open and distance learning. 
Uh, friends, in Block 3, um, you will see that, uh, as uh, I said earlier, that we have provided uh, a national case study of uh, our country, India. We have discussed about economic planning and education, the various fiber plans. The, you will see that the planning is up to 10th plan. There's a reference to provisional 10th plan uh, document, uh, whereas uh, we have uh, gone beyond that. We are into 11th plan. We are trying to revise uh, this year all the data that are provided there. Then we have discussed economics of Indian education, um, uh, expenditure in different uh, levels of education, primary, elementary, secondary, uh, higher education and research and adult education. And we have also discussed generation and utilization of resources, giving examples that how, from what sources we, we get money and on what we spend money. So generally there are student fees, the endowments, government support. Uh, you will see in distance education the government support is uh, going down, whereas the, there is marginal increase in student fees, and therefore uh, the institutions are hard pressed to balance uh, their balance sheet between income and expenditure, and therefore at the end of the day the income and expenditure uh, um, balance comes to uh, zero. Uh, and therefore, the institution, because we are not for profit institutions and we uh, would not consider making any profit, if there is any surplus that will be reinvested on provision, uh, expanding programs and uh, making provision for increase in facilities for uh, uh, learner support services and, uh, and the quality of teaching and learning. The fourth unit is very important here, which we would like to expand in our next uh, uh, revision. This block three, we are national perspective, we are trying to eliminate altogether because we, as, as you would realize that we have a lot of international students um, who are pursuing this master's program. We, almost 18, 19 countries, the students are pursuing this master's program and therefore we would like to replace that some of the pressing issues. We are planning to devote block three uh, to expand that unit four, state policy and funding of distance education. Uh, to uh, the entire block. We will call this block as costing and funding of distance education. You will see that in state policy and funding of distance education, which is very important because we we have uh, discussions, of course you would realize that economics of distance education is a new field of study and we have very limited number of uh, publications as case studies really research-based case studies available for institutional and uh, private cost of distance education in different parts of the world. And therefore, whatever is available, we have uh, tried to uh, provide that in Block 5. And some of the, some of the um, publications are um, uh, copyrighted, and therefore we are not able to get hold of because uh, you have to pay a lot. Uh, in terms of getting copyright, but we have provided references whereby you could get hold of those documents and uh, and uh, um, study on your own rather than making an institutional provision for that. In state funding, uh, w and, and therefore, um, uh, given that uh, the, the economics of distance education is a new area and very very little publications available, literature available in that area, and funding is certainly the least because there has been very rarely. Uh, discussions on funding of distance education. Maybe institutions would not like to disclose their own, but one, one can look at their, 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 their uh, annual reports in terms of uh, uh, annual uh, reports and accounts, and one can find out what kind of income and expend expenditure is available. Um, so after institutional adjustments are made, um, we have tried to provide here um, uh, the British uh, um, uh, Open University uh, Open University of Hong Kong, STOU, Sukhothai Thamatrat, Open University in um, Thailand, Universitas Terbuka in Indonesia, Open University of Sri Lanka, the Indian Conventional and Open Universities, and uh, other distant teaching institutions in, in the country. And we have tried to collate the findings um, uh, as highlights that what are the funding issues. And you would appreciate, you would realize that institutions would differ in their funding patterns from government, from student fees, from endowments, from their bank deposits, and from philanthropic organizations, and so on and so forth, as we call other sources. Um, but but uh, there are common threads available across these institutions that institutions are working hard to 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 reduce unit cost and uh, to mobilize resources as much resources as possible other than the government because the government support for higher education in any case is um, dwindling and therefore for distance education certainly it is not coming forward um, but then 
um, for uh, because in these kind of discuss discussions, you will realize that uh, in unit costing and funding, the capital investment and the investment in terms of infrastructure, including technological infrastructure, have not been considered which in our country, for instance, uh, is a national investment. For instance, an education satellite is a national investment, which is a huge investment. If you consider that, then it might seriously affect the unit cost of distance education. So these are the aspects that we have discussed in, in, in Block 3. If you go to Block 4, we have provided an SEN perspective to uh, open-end distance learning. This is based on a case study which our former uh, vice chancellor, Professor V. C. Kulandai Swami had undertaken as a World Bank supported project and, 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 and project supported by other agencies. Uh, this is a case study which is um, certainly you would uh, say that this is dated and uh, therefore uh, uh, we are trying to replace this case study to collate this case study into one unit and then replace um, other units by some of the latest case studies available within the Asian region. We are trying to bring in the case of Universitas Tarbaka, Indonesian case study of funding. We are also trying to bring in case studies from India, more particularly the latest data that are available on Indian case studies. We, uh, we are trying to bring in um, some of the ideas, uh, because this is copyrighted, some of the ideas that we have presented in a latest book by William Bramble and uh, myself, Santos Panda, on economics of distance and online learning, published by Routless New Work. We are trying to bring in some of the ideas and case studies published there, especially so far funding is concerned. We are trying to bring in those concepts to this Block 4. But right now, this Block 4 is uh, on, on, on a discussion on the social demand for education in the selected Asian countries. Um, the provision for higher education, the constants that are available within higher education or that are present within higher education, and how distance learning is trying to address those constraints and vis-a-vis -vis development of human resources and provision for continuing education within the higher education sector uh, in, in the Asian region. And, uh, and therefore, the final unit would be cost-effectiveness of distance education in, in, in Asia. We have discussed certain factors which will be contributing to determining cost uh, more particularly uh, practically within these uh, countries that have been discussed and what provisions, what, what strategies could be adopted to reduce um, uh, expenditure and increase quality in education and therefore balance between cost effectiveness and cost efficiency. Friends, the last block um, is, as I said, is a book of readings that we have provided uh, here. We have provided, as you will see, we have provided uh, five five uh, uh, units, economics of distance education, economics of mass distance education. Economics of distance education will be talking about uh, 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 generally uh, the case for economics of distance education, including funding and costing, more particularly costing, income and expenditure. Economics of mass distance education would consider all those uh, uh, variables keeping in view that when we are pro providing education to the larger community, economic analysis of radio and television university in China, because uh, a central radio and television university, as you know, uh, is uh, one of the largest mega universities in the world with provisional radio and television universities scattered almost all the provinces in China. Their cost analysis would be very different from any even large scale uh, university in including the Indira Gandhi National Open University. We have presented the IGNO case, uh, a study uh, conducted uh, earlier uh, by um, uh, Sia Pillai and C.J. Naidu, and that case study has, has been converted by me into a unit and economics of a small universities. And these readings uh, would be certainly facilitating you to conceptualize further the kind of discussions that we have undertaken in all the four modules, block one, two, three, four. Finally, friends, a few points about uh, the assignments and how to prepare for the examination. As you would see that uh, uh, July 15th is the last date for uh, depositing uh, uh, the assignment, uh, the only assignment. As you realize that earlier we used to have three assignments and now we have one assignment per course. And this is assignment three. Um, um, and there are three parts to the assignment. The first one um, answer the following question in about 800 words, and you have to be very particular about word plus minus, of course. 
critically discuss the cost structures and their application in various cost functions in distance education. So how the cost structures are and how they are applied in terms of cost functions within distance education. So you could try to discuss the cost structures generally and cost functions generally and give an example of distance education context and try to apply that very precisely within 800 words. And uh, your, your own formulation, your own case study, Maybe if it is a, even if it is a hypothetical case study, it would be very much facilitating in, in getting better grades. And sir, any three uh, of the four options that have been provided to you, and uh, these are short answer questions, uh, 250 to 300 words. And the final question is, uh, again, um, to be written in 800 words. Uh, this is about the funding. As I said, uh, one unit has been devoted to funding, and you could read thoroughly that and try to discuss the funding um, patterns across the three or four uh, five countries that we have provided, including India, that we have provided there, and find out the commonalities and suggest that what you consider as important uh, to, 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 to um, balance between um, um, subsidy, subsidy means the, the government funding, and, and the self-supporting or self-financing uh, aspect of the organization, especially the student fees. Because student fee uh, within the institutional income, other than the government, student fee contributes to larger chunk. So as you know, assignments uh, for the January session uh, will remain valid for January to November, and assignments for July session will be July to June next year. So um, if it is 2009, uh, so 2010, June, the July 2009 students, it will be valid. And uh, the grades, as you know, that there is a minimum D grade in continuous evaluation in assignment. Uh, you, could, uh, you could secure minimum D and still clear it. And minimum C grade in uh, the paper, in the every paper, in the term and examination. And final grade assignments and term and examination put together would be a C grade because it can't be a D grade. So, but D with assignment, C with uh, term and examination, and final C. Uh, term and examination, you are eligible to appear in the term and examination after completion of one year. If you are a student of January session, for instance, January 2009, you may appear in the term and examination in December 2009. If you are a student of July 2009, you will be appearing in June 2010. So, friends, thank you very much. But there is a provision for our re evaluation of answer scripts, which you will find from the assignment booklet that we have circulated to you, and certainly from the program guide that we have given. Thank you very much. We come to the end of the program. And uh, if you have any particular questions on this, um, I'm sure um, you would be a uh, little enlightened with this presentation to pursue, and I have tried to encourage you to, to pursue uh, this course. This course is a very specialized course indeed. Uh, within distance education, you need to have some little background of economics of uh, education as we have provided in the first block. And I'm sure uh, with little concentration, you'll be able to appreciate. If you have any problems, uh, you could uh, write to me directly um, through my email, spanda, S-P-A-N-D-A, at igno.ac.in. We have given all these addresses in our assignment as well as uh, um, uh, student handbook, uh, MAD handbook. So you are welcome, and even if you would like to discuss your um, uh, um, assignment also, you are welcome. And for ES320 for the project, we have tried to allocate uh, individual supervisors from stride for you, and if you happen to be uh, associated with me, I'll be very glad to provide my suggestions and uh, uh, supervisor comments for doing your project work, ES320. Thank you. Thank you very much.